John chapter 12, beginning in verse 27. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it was saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word, your holy, infallible word, life-giving word now. Illuminate its truths to our hearts. Work your will in us. In this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we come to this passage, we come to something that has troubled theologians, the troubled Jesus. And it's troubled theologians because at first glance it seems to be a denial of his divinity because God is never troubled. The fact is, though, as we look at the earthly life of Jesus, Jesus did much to show us he was both God and man. Not half God, half man, but truly God and truly man. God doesn't sleep. In fact, the book of Psalms tells us he neither slumbers nor sleeps, but Jesus slept. Jesus slept in a most supernatural way, if you remember, when everyone else was panicking on a boat about to capsize because of the storm. Jesus had supernatural sleep. And yet, he was God. And he proved it by standing up and calming the storm. So he is both God and man. Truly God, truly man. And because there's nothing in this natural world that is both 100% one thing and 100% another thing. There's no analogy we can turn to. We just have to cry out, mystery. And that's the case when we come to God. In fact, we're bumping into mystery on almost every page of our Bible. And we should get used to bumping into mystery. We can go so far, we can say what it is, and we can say, I believe it. Do I understand it all? No. But I know this, it's not a contradiction, but it is mysterious. And for us to come across a verse that talks of the troubled Jesus is troubling because we don't always come to the text with a full understanding of this is Jesus as a man. This is Jesus talking about suffering. God doesn't suffer. But Jesus did. And Jesus suffered for us. What we have in the Trinity is the mystery that there is one God and three persons. We don't know of anything in this world that is one and three. One in essence, God is. Three in persons. We try to make analogies, but all of them fall short. Uh, none of them really fully describe the way it is with the Trinity. And it's not a new invention. The Trinity always existed. And again, that boggles our minds. The Father always loved the Son. The Son always loved the Father. The Holy Spirit was always God. And so we worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in doing so, in worshiping the Son, are not worshiping someone less than God, and that itself would be blasphemy. And Jesus accepted worship, oftentimes in his ministry. Do you remember after the resurrection, there was a man who saw him as Jesus appeared to him. And Jesus acknowledged what he was saying was true when he said, My Lord and my God. In fact, he said, It's taking you so long and you see only because you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. He accepted the worship. If he wasn't God, 
that itself would be blasphemy. And that's what's in view oftentimes in the Gospel of John. Jesus made absolute clear claims to deity and the crowd who understood the Old Testament, as we understand that phrase, understood what he was saying. My father's working and I'm working. That was a claim to divinity. I am. I am is a claim to divinity. John chapter 8, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Not just Jesus the teacher, Jesus the history maker, the one who can even split time in half, B.C. and A.D. No, I am. We must believe specific things about Jesus. And in the doctrine we have of Christ, we speak of one person with two natures. He had a truly human nature and a truly divine nature. The word troubled, as you look in the text, now my soul has become troubled, is a form of the word tarasso, and it means to be shaken, means to be stirred up. It's a strong word. It speaks of severe mental anguish. That was something that certainly was the case later on in the Garden of Gethsemane. It means to be upset. It means to be unsettled. It means to be not only uncomfortable, but horrified. Why was he troubled? Do you realize other people have faced death, both before this time and after this time? And they face death with calmness. You can read of the reformers who, uh, under the rule of Bloody Mary, as she was called, in the English Reformation, were martyred for their faith, and they often went to their deaths with great supernatural calmness, I'm sure, buoyed up by the Holy Spirit. So why wasn't Christ buoyed up at this moment? Well, he was in one sense, but yet as a man he was troubled. Wasn't he God? Yes. Well, God's never troubled. Have you ever prayed, and if you could hear the audible voice of God, uh, be something like this, not that you can normally, I trust, otherwise we need to talk. But Lord, I'm in trouble, I'm troubled, and imagine this coming from God. You think you got issues. Uh, we've had to lay 38 angels off this morning, we can't pay the light bill here. you got your needs, I've got my needs. I don't even want to talk to you about Persia and... and uh, Ethiopia and all, all of the kingdoms of this world and that no no God is never troubled that's why one of his names is Jehovah Jehovah Shalom a peace he's not the Lord who is troubled you get close to God and you're gonna have more peace not less Jesus is the Prince of Peace Yet he gives us his peace in the midst of trouble. And he said, in this world you will have trouble. A big trouble. We call it tribulation, hardship, suffering. He never promised an easy life. But he says, that's not the end of the sentence. In this world you will have trouble, big trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I've overcome all that's against you. As I look at this text, I think uh, I would be troubled if he wasn't troubled. If he just was so calm that he wasn't troubled, I would actually question whether he was truly man. He was truly man, and he was truly God. But recognize this, Christ was not an actor. An actor can just take on the nature of someone. They study the person, they read a book on the person, they say, how can I more accurately portray him. I'm going to get in his mindset. I'm going to think like him. I'm going to develop his accent. I'm going, to, I'm going to act so that when people see me, they think they're looking at him. Christ wasn't an actor. He wasn't acting out scenes from a play. Nor was he indifferent. Book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 7 says, In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death and he was heard because of his piety. Jesus was fully engaged. Jesus was in the moment as a man even though he prophesied all that would take place 
and knew that all was in his father's hands. So what was it that troubled Christ? Let me suggest to you it wasn't the physical suffering. I think that certainly would be troubling, but that wasn't the biggest thing. The troubling was what he was about to endure in the spiritual arena. He speaks of it as the cup in Matthew 26, other places. And he asked, if it were possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup was the anger of God, not due to him, due to us, that he was enduring for our sake. You see, no Hollywood movie can portray the spiritual sufferings of Christ. Have you noticed that? You can do a two-hour movie. Mel Gibson tried. And for two hours, just... Uh, reenacted the physical sufferings of Christ, although he threw in a few Roman Catholic dimensions in there too. Yet, when we come to the Bible, the Bible couldn't have been more succinct. Do you know that word, succinct? How do you sum up a two-hour movie? It takes Hollywood two hours to betray it, and in our Bibles we have three words. John nineteen eighteen. They crucified him. I, I don't know. I, I would think it is actually impossible to say it in less words. They crucified him. Everyone in the first century knew what that meant. They'd seen crucifixions, whether they were in Israel or not. Israel was known for crucifixions throughout the known empire. And so you could be living thousands of miles away from Jerusalem and still see a crucifixion. The Romans had mastered the art so, so well. It was used very, very often. Thousands upon thousands of people were crucified. Everyone knew what that meant. Here we have to go back and put a movie on. That wasn't it for Christ. No Hollywood movie can portray the spiritual suffering of Christ. No camera can capture it. And such was the case. But when it did happen, just a few days after what this passage we're reading, God drew the curtain on it. God closed the blinds. It was something earth was never meant to see. We call it Good Friday. And it was the darkest day in human history. Here's how the book of Matthew records it. Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. God says, we're closing the curtain. This is not for earthly eyes. This is me doing business with my son. The biblical text sums it up. They crucified him. And yet, as we look through our Bibles, it's something that's portrayed in terms of the spiritual sufferings of Christ in ways that are so numerous, it would take us hours upon hours to even walk through the text of Scripture to describe it. Do you remember Isaiah 53? Amazing as it may seem, 700 years roughly before this incident, the prophet Isaiah described the spiritual sufferings of Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the punishment due to, him was a, due to us was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. You think, wouldn't you, that the gospel writers would outline all the wounds of Christ? They don't. They just simply say they scourged him. They crucified him. It was a shameful thing to be crucified. That's why in the book of Hebrews, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who despising the shame, despising the shame, it was shameful in the eyes of men to be crucified. Let me suggest to you it's glorious for all those given eyes to really see. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12. Let me ask you, have your eyes been opened to see glory in the cross? That's the way the King James Version puts it, as... Paul relates the wonders of the cross to the Galatian church. He says, God forbid that I should glory, boast. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Do you see glory in the, in the cross? You see, the cross was the place where the spotless Son of God would suffer vicariously. Don't be put off by that big word. In our place, for all the sins of all those who would ever believe. The hymn writer put it, In my place condemned he stood. So Jesus was troubled because he knew there was spiritual suffering, something that was unique. By the way, when you use the word unique, you don't say very unique. It's either unique or it isn't. It means one of a kind. And Jesus' suffering was unique. There'd been nothing like it. There would be nothing like it forever. Yet notice Jesus' resolve. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Get me out of here. Beam me up, Scotty. Father, get me out of here. The Bible says he could have. He could have called upon legions of angels to whisk him off the cross because he didn't have to be there for himself. There was no estrangement between the Father and the Son, nor would there be throughout this ordeal. He was the spotless Son of God throughout, the Holy One, the Lamb of God, the perfect One who takes away our sin. Save me from this hour, is that the deal? No, 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 no. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. We've talked about the fact that His hour had now come. Up until this point, He'd said, my hour has not come, and He'd walk through crowds trying to kill Him. Now, my, I, my, my hour has come, and He was submitting passively to the will of his father. Save me from this hour, get me out of here. No, he was resolved. How? Why? Why was he resolved? Well, one reason, in fact, we can turn to the book of Luke, chapter 18. We're in John, the last book before John is the book of Luke, chapter 18. There's many, many scriptures we could go to, to that speak of Jesus letting folk know this is going to happen. I'm going to go to the cross. Here's one of them, verse 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he, that's the Son of Man, will be handed over to the Gentiles, that's the Romans, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon, and after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Look at verse 46. Actually, of chapter 24. Go to Luke 24. In fact, on the way... Because it's so good, look at verse 25. Do you remember this was the road to Emmaus after the resurrection? Jesus, uh, not giving away his identity at this point, was just asking questions. Why do you guys look sad? And um, they said, well, <laughs> there's, there's this amazing guy. We thought he was the Messiah, but, but he died. And some people are talking about him raising from the dead and we don't know where we are in any of this. Look at verse 25. He said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? We either see shame in the cross or we see glory. Then beginning with Moses, that's the first five books, of our Bibles, and with all the prophets, that's the rest, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. That's a Bible study I wish I could have attended. Look at verse 46. In fact, verse 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the three designations the Jews had for the Old Testament, the Old Covenant as we would describe it, must be fulfilled. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. Back to the Gospel of John. So he did not pray, Father, save me from this hour, but he made the statement, it's for this purpose I came to this hour. This is the whole point. Verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Henry C. Thiessen once wrote this, Christ did not come primarily to set us an example or to teach us doctrine, but to die for us. His death was not an afterthought or an accident, but the accomplishment of a definite purpose in connection with the incarnation. The incarnation is not an end in itself. It is but a means to an end, and that end is redemption. The redemption of the lost through the Lord's death on the cross. I agree. Father, glorify your name. So one of the reasons Jesus had resolve was he knew it was the Father's will all along. He'd been saying it. In fact, it was not new. In the announcement to Joseph regarding Mary, the angel said, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not he'll be a great teacher. He'll change history. But he has come on a mission. Mission, save the elect, his people. My question to you is, do you believe he did it? I believe he did. Glorify your name. So it was to do the will of his Father, but it was also to glorify the Father. That's what his whole ministry was about. He says, I don't do my own thing. I haven't got my own agenda. My will is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I always do what is pleasing to the Father. I could never say that, but Jesus could. And the Father attested that by saying at the baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Do you remember also, he said similar words at the transfiguration. He's on course. He's always pleasing me. And it was the Son's desire to glorify the Father. James Montgomery Boyce writes, To glorify God is his chief end. He will not shrink from following whatever way the Father chooses to have the Son glorify him. We've already sung, Oh, Father, use this ransomed life in any way you choose. For the Son, the way the Father had chosen was the road to Calvary. Then we read, Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So again, just as at the baptism and at the transfiguration, the Father boomed out His voice, and in both of those places it was making, He was making a very clear statement of who His Son was and how He had glorified Him and how He had pleased Him. Now the Father's voice boomed out His affirmation, Jesus' desire, was that God's name be glorified. And the Father says, that's already happened. And it will continue to happen. That was assurance, I'm sure, for the disciples that what was about to take place was in no way God's disapproval of His Son. Hear that. You see, we're so used to reading of the cross and the resurrection that people are walking through all this in time and they've not yet read the Gospel of John. They haven't read the back of the book. They didn't know how it all ended. And for them, it looked like the end of all things when the Messiah's hanging on a tree. We thought he was the Messiah, but our own book, the book of Deuteronomy, tells us the one who hangs on a tree is cursed. The writer Paul to the Galatians takes up that theme in Galatians 3 and says he was a curse, but he became the curse for us. It's the exact opposite of disapproval. God had been glorified and would be in all that was about to transpire. Imagine these Greeks, that's the context, they've come and they're they're saying, we wish to see Jesus. And it's as if Jesus says, all right, great. 
But unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And he's telling the Greeks, who I would no doubt hear of it, you've come in a very, uh, a very unusual, for a very unusual week of ministry. I'm not going to be healing the sick from this point on. I'm going to be dying. But unless I do this, there won't be eternal fruit. An amazing thing. If they'd come 18 weeks before, they'd have seen a miracle. Ministry from Jesus, I'm sure. Jesus, the Bible says, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. But this week, when they arrived, was the week when Jesus was about to die, and he was explaining that fact. That's all happening in this passage. Do you see glory here? Glorify your name. Oh, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Do you see glory in the cross? May the Holy Spirit help us to see glory in the cross. Glory in this world is fleeting, isn't it? We speak of our glory days, the days when we were in full manhood, full womanhood. We got the pictures up on the wall. Those were my glory days, my sporting achievements. The glory in eternity. Glory in eternity. So different from glory in this world. Glory in this world is fleeting. Kobe Bryant has glory in this world. I hope he can enjoy glory in eternity. Glory in eternity lasts for eternity. And what those who are ransomed in heaven glory in is not what they accomplished on some court or even what they did outside the court in helping people. Their glory is only in the cross. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Verse 29, So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it was saying it, that it had thundered. You ever read that and been just mystified by that? Some said, it thundered. Now the voice strengthened the faith of the disciples. Others gave their own explanations. It was, it was natural phenomenon. It, 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 we can't really explain it, not sure, but it, it sounded like thunder to me. Yeah, I, I, me too. Nothing more. Nothing more to see here. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Others were Aware that there's something special about Jesus. I don't quite know it all, but something supernatural is happening. I, I, I think that was an angel. Do you think that? Yeah, Bob, I, I think that was an angel. That sounded like an angel to me. Yeah, I've never heard that before. So there was division amongst the crowd. Is it thunder? Is it an angel? It was the Father's voice. It's reading earlier today of the book of Acts. Do you remember when Saul was converted in Acts chapter 9? We read this, verse 7. The men who traveled with him, that's Saul of Tarsus, stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And then later on, when Paul recounts his testimony, chapter 22, verse 9. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. What did he say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? An attack against the church was an attack against Christ, the head and the body are one. And perhaps, I speculate at this point, but perhaps Paul began to understand the, do began to understand the, the doctrine of the church in this encounter with Christ. To attack Christ the church of Christ is to attack Christ himself. He spoke and wrote much about the body of Christ. John MacArthur writes, the crowd's inability to understand God's voice illustrates the hard-heartedness that was typical of the people who had likewise failed to hear the voice of God's word and his son. The issue is not that God is silent, but that fallen sinful people are deaf. This reality is the result of sinful fallenness and divine sovereign judgment. Do you remember these words? Matthew 13, 13. While hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. 
And this was God's judgment on the crowd. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. This was a voice that strengthened the faith of the disciples. Brothers, they just speculated. I think that was thunder. Natural phenomenon. Oh, it's something supernatural, but I, 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 I don't know. I guess we, we're not meant to know. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Verse 31, now judgment is upon this world, Jesus said. This world is a reference to the world set in its hostility towards Christ. To reject Christ is to reject salvation. It's only found in Him. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The same chapter that brings us verse 16, brings us verse 36. I'm referring to John chapter 3. The same chapter that tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Just a few verses down says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We need to have an understanding that allows us to believe both verses. God so loved the world, and yet God's wrath is on all those who will not believe on the Son. There's judgment upon this world. And it's seen in the cross. And then it says, Now the ruler of this world has been cast out. So not only the world in its hostility is judged, but the ruler of this world, the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4, God with a small g, referring to the devil. This would have been news because what was about to happen has been marked by even many preachers as Satan winning. Satan won at the cross, but only in the resurrection did Jesus defeat the devil. That is so horrible, so heretical. I just have to point out, Jesus was never more victorious when he hung there for us. It was not a defeat. The demons were not having a party. They were not saying, we won. They were being defeated, and the book of Colossians tells us. In the natural realm, it looked like Christ was the public spectacle. He was the one hanging in shame. But Jesus despised that shame. But the book of Colossians says, in the cross, he triumphed over them in it, the cross. As he hung there, he hung there for sin, and it was the triumph of all triumphs. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that the devil, seeking whom he may devour, as First Peter speaks of him, was crushing the saints, putting them to death. And it says of the saints, Revelation 12, 11, they, the saints, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They died victoriously by means of the victory of the cross, the blood of the Lamb. Jesus made a public spectacle of the devil. If we could have been given eyes to see Calvary's cross, though everything in our natural gaze told us this is the end of all ends, this is the dream that has ended, if we could see with spiritual eyes, Jesus was never more victorious. He was never more in the will of God. He was never more in right standing with his Father, yet he was absorbing the wrath due to us and winning, winning, winning. This is for all sin. This is for all sickness. This is for all disease. This is for all bankruptcy. This is for all estrangement. I am removing the entire curse from this world in my death. That's why in heaven, the blessings that we will enjoy are Calvary sent blessings. He bore the penalty for our disastrous sin 
and has given us the measure of blessing beyond all blessings in his death for us so that every peace and every enjoyment of God we enjoy is because of Calvary and the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan is a defeated foe. He's totally defeated now. And this is just the mop-up operation. He's been cast out. He has no place in heaven. He has no access to the throne of God right now. He's been cast out by means of the cross. He has no right to rule. He does not rule. His rule in this world is very temporary. Verse 32. Jesus then said, And I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He is saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. I come from a church in England where they sang a song often. If the Holy Spirit was on the song, they kept on the song, could be for 45 minutes. Literally. And one of them was about lifting up the Son of God, because that's how he's going to draw all men. And so the idea was, let's march into the center of town and lift up Jesus. Lift, lift him higher. Because he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. So the way to evangelism is not go tell them the good news of the gospel. Just lift Jesus up. Just lift him up in worship. And by that means, all people will be drawn. And we wondered why the church wasn't growing. The reason the church wasn't growing was because we believed verse 32 but didn't believe verse 33 or didn't, didn't even read verse 33. Because the drawing is not because Jesus is lifted up in worship but that Jesus is lifted up in his death. Hold your finger in John 12 and go back to chapter 3 for a moment. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. The reference there is to Moses lifting up the serpent when the people had been bitten by serpents and all who looked at that serpent on the pole were healed. And in the same way, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up on the cross in that way, he would draw all men to himself. What does that phrase, all men, mean? Well, we could speculate, but we don't need to. It's here both in the context of the passage and the rest of the New Testament, we get much, much help. That's why we should read any verse with the verse around the verse and the passages around the passage and read the book and then read the rest of the Bible because the Bible sheds much light on every verse. One man humorously said, it's, a, it's amazing how much light the Bible sheds on these commentaries. <laughs> May I ask you a question? Is everyone drawn to Christ by the cross? Think biblically for a moment. A lot of people say, well, all men means all men. Well, if that's the case, then we've got problems because... The Bible says not everybody's drawn by the cross. Think of your Bible for a moment. Think of the New Testament. Think of a passage that speaks directly to this issue. And it's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. Let me read it to you. For the word of the cross, the message of the cross, is drawing for everybody. Is that what your Bible says? No foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks Search for wisdom. But we preach, Christ, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block. Why? Because their own book says anyone who hangs on a tree is under God's curse. And to Gentiles, foolishness. 
what could be the most ridiculous message that you're saying that some itinerant Jewish guy who was preaching was stuck on a pole and that's the only entrance point into heaven? That's silly. Yep, it's foolish. Except it is God's message. We don't preach Christ the educator, Christ the moral pep talk giver, the one you need at half time when you're losing. We preach Christ crucified. To Jews, it's a stumbling block. To Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks. So the called amongst Jewish people and the called amongst the Gentiles. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. If we think about it, The Jews, yeah, it was a curse. But Christ became a curse for us. For Gentiles who seek for wisdom, there's no greater wisdom than this. Jews seeking signs, there's no greater sign than Christ and his death and resurrection for wisdom. You won't beat the wisdom of God here. Rather than the cross drawing all people to Christ. The Bible tells us its message is either a stumbling block or foolishness to all except the called. If you see anything in the cross beyond just a dream that died, God's been very gracious to you and has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so that your boast is only in that cross. Paul knew this. He was under no illusions. He knew that when he went into any town or city, he's going to face ridicule and hostility. The Jews, that's a stumbling block. Gentiles, foolishness, Paul. He says, I know that. I know that going in, but I'm not going to change the message. I'm not going to say, what will get me the most biggest crowd? I'm going to preach Christ crucified, and I know this going in. Many will reject it, whether they're Jews or Greeks, but the called will hear it. They'll hear the message. The Holy Spirit will attend the Word of God, and they're going to get it. And they're going to see in the cross the wisdom of God and the power of God. And I'm sent to go round up those sheep. He knew he was going to face ridicule, hostility, for preaching the message, yet he preached the message of the cross anyway, knowing that it's the means by which the call will come to Christ. Thank God for the person that told you about the cross. So both the rest of the New Testament and the context of the passage, remember, Greeks are now coming for the first time. The all men, I believe, refers to all kinds of men. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw all kinds of men. That's the way that phrase is used often. In our New Testament, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. First Timothy says, and all men means all kinds of men, people from every tribe, every tongue, every people group, every nation, who are not only drawn but redeemed. Ladies and gentlemen, the cross was no hypothetical atonement. It was an actual atonement. It was not something that only becomes effective if we do something. No, Christ not only died for our sins, but in his cross gives the gifts of repentance and faith to his elect people. It was real propitiation, real removal of wrath. I quoted earlier, Matthew 1, 21, he'll save his people from their sins. Let me ask you, did he? That's a consistent testimony of Scripture. He gave himself for us. His death and intercession was for the same exact people. You could read of this in Romans 8. In fact, let's go there just for a moment. That's the us that's in, in view from verse 28 onwards to the end of the chapter. Just read through the text and look at the we and the us and see that it's the same people in view. Verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together 
for good, to those who love God, to those who are called, here's that word again, the called, according to his purpose. Who are the called? It's those who, are love, who, who have a love for God. He explains further, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. Notice that. Everyone who receives this kind of call ends up justified. It's a powerful call. No one falls through the cracks. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. It's not some of those, some of those, some of those. No, these. It means every one of those he predestined, he called. And every one he called, he justified. And every one he justified, he also glorified. What should be our response to these things? Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? Some Christians say, I don't believe it. <laughs> no, that's not the right response. The right response is, if God is for us, who is against us? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who shows up in opposition. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Who's the us all? All those he foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? And just to make sure we're not seeing a different people group in mind. He continues in the next phrase. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's not like he's now going to talk about election. He's saying the same thing. This group. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? In other words, it doesn't matter. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes. Rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Same group. You see, in the high priest of Israel, intercession was made for the twelve tribes, not for everybody else. There was no intercession made for the Amalekites and the Canaanites, it was the people of Israel. And then sacrifice and atonement was made for that same people who were interceded for. And that's exactly what we see in John 17. He says, I'm not praying for the world, I'm praying for those you've given me. And that was his intercession and the next day he died for the same people. You read John 17 in your own time, you'll see it. There's one people in view, those whom the Father gave him. Jesus had already said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I'll certainly not cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. The word drawn here is the Greek word elko, it means to drag as in the dragging of a heavy object. And John 6.44 tells us that the ones who are drawn are raised up in, on the last day. They're drawn so powerfully they end up in heaven. Question for you. If the all men refer to everybody on planet Earth, you end up with universalism. Everyone is drawn. Everyone raised up on the last day. It doesn't mean that. There's a powerful drawing, but it's for the called. Why? Because only God can get us to God. By ourselves, we don't want the true God. We want the blessings of God without the God who gives the blessing. By the preaching of the cross, the Holy Spirit effectually draws all he calls and brings them to saving faith, and none of these will fail to come, and none of these will ever be lost. But Jesus doesn't save us outside of the means of the cross. Let me end with this. Kent Hughes uses an illustration. It's a story about a boy and his model sailboat. He longed for such a toy, he got a kit, spent weeks laboring to build this beautiful sailboat. Finally it was complete, he took it down to the lake. It sailed so beautifully that it just kept going, right out of sight. And despite all his efforts, the boy couldn't find the boat. 
Several weeks later, he was walking past the store window, when to his amazement, to his amazement, he saw the same boat, only it now had an expensive price tag on it. He went into the store and explained to the shopkeeper what had happened, and the owner said, but I'm sorry, son, um, I paid a great deal of money for this toy boat, and uh, I cannot give it to you for, for free. So the boy took up jobs and worked and worked and worked until he finally had enough money to buy his boat back. At last he walked out of the store with his precious boat in his hand and he said, now you're twice mine. Once because I made you and once because I bought you. So it is with God. He created us and then we were lost in sin. He purchased us with the precious blood of Christ on the cross. How wonderful is the love of God revealed in the cross of Christ. Love and justice meet at the cross. He bought us by his blood. So shall he say, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I came. The cross was the place where the spotless Son of God would suffer in our place for all the sins of all those who would ever believe, past, present, and future. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Philip P. Bliss wrote that famous hymn. Let me end with this. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, then anew his song will sing. Hallelujah. What a Savior. I call upon you to repent of all you know to be wrong and put your full trust in the work, the finished work of the perfect Savior who died on the cross for sin and rose again from the dead is now seated in the place of all authority in this, in this universe. Despising the shame, he is now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this testimony of the scripture. We submit to its truths even as we pray for all under the sound of my voice to turn from all except the one who can save and in turning to him find full salvation, not a fleeting salvation, but an eternal one and a great salvation. Not a fragile salvation, a great salvation secured by the strong work of the perfect Savior. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.